do you to the speakers do you guys want me to to give you the two minutes warning sometimes it's a bit uh, weird in video to 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 do the well, warning for me yes please okay so it's 12 minutes so at, at 10 minutes i give a warning great for me as well please okay great and yeah, me thank you that's fine by me thank you and me as well okay me too yes <laughs> great <laughs> So I think we can start. So good uh, morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. Uh, welcome back to this uh, second, no, yeah, second to last session of this great workshop. So now we're gonna discuss a little bit of cross correlation, cross correlations between the 21 centimeter line and other signals. So I think we can get start. Oh yes, let me re remind you that um, uh, asking questions on Slack is preferential, so we can have everything archived. But if you have problem accessing Slack, just um, write your question in the in the chat. Um, we can start with the uh, Dennis Dennis Tramonte. Can you share your screen? Yes. Is it visible? It's perfect, and we can hear you well. So Dennis is going to tell us about uh, the neutral cosmic web from stacks of 21 centimeter intensity maps. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm Denis Tramonte. I'm a postdoc here at uh, Purple Mountain Observatory in uh, Nanjing. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to present this work in, the, in this very nice conference. So uh, let's dive straight in. Um, so H1 and the cosmic web. Well, we know from numerical simulations that uh, the neutral gas is a very good tracer of uh, cosmic structures at low redshift, uh, as we can see, for example, from this uh, snapshot of a numerical simulation. So uh, the question is, can we actually observe this neutral cosmic web with, with our telescopes? And uh, this is what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. And I will focus in particular on two types of structures. The nodes of the cosmic web, which are the locations with the highest column density in neutral hydrogen. And then uh, we will focus on the filaments which of course are fainter and harder to detect. Of course, uh, our uh, observable is the 21 centimeter line and the technique is the intensity mapping. Now there is no need to go through any detail here. Uh, I just want to uh, stress that the intensity mapping is actually the best probe for this kind of, uh, of study because it allows us to have, uh, uh, well, to sample very large volumes, uh, cosmologically relevant volumes. Uh, the drawback, of course, is that we cannot detect individual structures in the maps. So we need to use some statistics to, to, get, the, um, to get the signal we are looking for. This has been done before. And uh, uh, what people usually do is to combine uh, H1 maps uh, with uh, object tracers, typically uh, galaxy catalogs. And what they do is they go to Fourier space and they compute the cross-correlation power spectrum between the two. Uh, here are some examples, and uh, some of which have been also cited uh, in previous talks in this conference. Uh, so the main take home message from this slide is that uh, this is a quite established technique, and it can be applied to uh, different redshift ranges and different sky coverages. So uh, what we want to do is a little bit different. We still want to combine maps and galaxies, but uh, we want to do it in real space. And this is done by stacking the objects we're interested in on the maps. So notice this is not uh, spectral stacking, which is also another uh, quite established technique. It is a positional stacking of objects on the map. The maps we're going to use are uh, uh, these ones obtained with the uh, uh, Parkes telescopes. Uh, they are quite remarkable because they have a very large sky coverage, about 1300 square degrees. 
Uh, they are divided in six patches, which you can see uh, plotted here, uh, sliced at their central frequency. Uh, the units are millikelvin. This is basically H1 brightness temperature. The spectral resolution of these maps is uh, uh, one megahertz, and the redshift range uh, covered by each patch is from 0.06 to 0.1. So this is quite uh, low redshift. Uh, of course, whenever we use intensity maps, uh, foregrounds are a major issue. So we will be using two versions of these maps, obtained by removing respectively 10 and 20 modes in a principal component analysis. This will allow us to uh, assess the uh, level of contamination from foregrounds in, in our uh, results. Uh, the galaxies uh, are taken from the 2DF spectroscopic catalog because it has a very uh, nice overlap with the volume spanned by the, by the maps. Uh, in total, we have around 50,000 galaxies, and we do some uh, further splitting of this sample into the central ones, which are defined as the locally uh, brightest ones, and the satellites. This will allow us to infer some information on possibly, possible dependencies on the local environment. So now that we have the maps and the galaxies, we just go and perform the stacks. And these are the results for both foreground removed schemes and for all three samples. Now, first of all, we do have a detection of a, of a signal. Uh, this is a physical signal. It's not an artifact from the stacks. Indeed, if we randomize the position of the galaxies and we repeat the stack, we obtain something like this. So we completely destroy this signal. So what we are looking at here is the bulk H1 inside the galaxies that we are stacking on the maps. Uh, we see that the central galaxies tend to uh, produce more irregular and kind of uh, spread out signals. But to be more quantitative, uh, we should extract some profiles, some radial profiles, which are shown here for all cases. And now we can see that the satellites in general tend to have a higher amplitude which uh, suggests that they are H1 richer as one could expect. Uh, but still the main difference in amplitude comes from the choice of a specific uh, foreground removal scheme. So this is still the major issue that uh, affects the, the results. Um, this uh, shaded area around each profile represents the, uncert the uncertainty on the measurement. Um, we have a quite solid detection at around um, more than 10 sigma, and these profiles are resolved. This is by comparison the the, the parks beam. So it is meaningful to go and study for some theoretical modeling of these profiles. But the issue is the following. If you look at these angular scales of one degree at the mean redshift of the sample, they correspond to a scale, a physical scale of a few megaparsec. So, of course, these are not galactic scale objects. These are very big halos, which are uh, somehow um, artificially created in the process of uh, producing the intensity maps by merging the contribution of several individual galaxies together. So, of course, there is no recipe in the literature to model su such an object, but still we can use some uh, existing functional forms and try to uh, to um, provide a theoretical prediction. So the idea here would be to compare the prediction with the measurement, and this way provide estimates on the parameters that govern some scaling relation, for example, the scaling between the H1 mass and the uh, virial halo mass, uh, or parameters that control the shape of the H1 profile. But in our case, we don't know the masses of these objects that, that we detect. So we're kind of missing the starting point of this process. So what the only thing that is left to do here is just to uh, take this scaling relation and the profile as granted, we don't touch the parameters, and we just fit for what we don't know, which is the mass, the real mass of the objects. We also allow for the, in the case of the profile to have one free parameter, which is the H1 concentration. When we perform the fit, we obtain this kind of result. Um, this is the posterior distribution on the parameters. And uh, this is a comparison between uh, the measurement and the best fit. We see that the prediction um, is quite good in capturing the dependence of the measurement on the um, angular separation. So let's look at, this, at these numbers. Uh, we find huge masses and very low concentrations. So uh, this is basically confirming what I was telling before that um, 
this is not uh, a single halo, a physically a physical single halo that we're observing, but it is the merge the merge contribution of several independent smaller halos that uh, produce a low concentration. Anyway, this technique, if someone has a good characterization of the masses, could be used to indeed uh, provide constraints on the parameters that dictate the abundance of H1 in the halos. Now let's move on to the filaments. Uh, in this case, uh, things are a bit different because we don't have a filament catalog. So what we do is uh, we take the central 2DF galaxies and we consider pairs of these galaxies which satisfy these conditions on the projected separation and on the line of sight separation. Uh, this makes these pairs, which are in total 270,000, uh, likely to be connected by a large scale filament. So once we have these endpoints of the filament, we go and stack them. But again, the stack here is more complicated due to the three-dimensional nature of the filament. So uh, first of all, uh, from the H1 uh, maps or from the H1 data cube, we have to slice out a plane that contains the two endpoint galaxies and hopefully the filament in between. Then we perform a rotation and a scaling in order to uh, place the two galaxies always in these uh, positions, minus one and plus one, in order to have them uh, coherently uh, aligned when we do the stack of, uh, of, the, of all the pairs. So uh, these are the results, again, for, the, for both um, foreground removal schemes. Uh, the first column shows the stack as, as they are obtained from this process. We clearly identify the contribution from the galactic H1, and then there's something in between. And this could, could be a filament or not, but uh, uh, in order to be sure, we have to first fit for the contribution of the um, one halo term only, let's say, from this galactic H1, and then we subtract it from the stack. The final residual map shows that uh, actually there is no evidence for an for an excess temperature in the center. So uh, this qual qualifies. Left. Thank you. So this qualifies and as a non-detection of the filament. Uh, as a further proof of this, um, we show here a one-dimensional cut uh, of these maps along the x-axis taken at y equals zero. Uh, you see that. Uh, the sum of the two contributions from the halo, I mean, from the individual galaxy part, uh, is enough in the center to account for all the observed amplitude. So uh, we don't get to a filament detection, but uh, we can still place upper limits based on our uncertainty. And the upper limits uh, are uh, measured for relevant quantities. So for, for example, for the H1 brightness temperature, for the column density, uh, the product of the local baryon over density and the uh, neutral fraction. And finally, for a filament thickness, assuming that the gas is as uniform density. So we are quite conservative in this approach so that these upper limits are not very tight, but overall they are in agreement with the results from numerical simulations. Uh, it's also interesting to see that, uh, uh, well, if you, if you place on a scatter plot the values of the column density and of the neutral fraction, you find that they align in a in specific kind of specific curve. And our findings uh, are, are found to be in the place of, uh, among the highest occurrence, let's say, of the points from the simulation. So all of this is consistent. Uh, we don't have a, det a detection, but again, if the maps were uh, more sensitive, uh, that is a good methodology to explore. So uh, to wrap up the conclusions, uh, we saw how these kind of stacks in real space with uh, 21 centimeter intensity maps can nicely complement more established techniques like the computation of power spectra. Uh, we got a detection of H1 in halos and showed how, how it can be used to test models. And for the filaments, uh, well, with this methodology, there is not there has not been a detection yet, but we got upper limits that are in agreement with simulation. Uh, we expect uh, the improved new data set to um, allow us to go deeper in this kind of research and get uh, new results. But of course, 
the main issue is still the foreground removal, which really is the one that dictates the, the amplitude of the signal that, uh, that we are going to measure. I leave here as a reference the two works that uh, summarize the, these two uh, type of analysis, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Denis. We already have a question for you from Simon Foreman. So motivated by your interpretation that the park stacks are probing the contribution of several galaxies in different halos, have you considered incorporating a two halo term in your modeling? Exactly. So um, no, this is just uh, uh, computing a one halo term, but uh, we did in, the, in fact find some evidence here for a contribution of a two halo term, especially at larger scales. And here it would be important. The problem is that uh, uh, if you want to take into account the two halo term, you need a full, uh, halo model. Uh, so when you do that, you need to integrate um, over, over the mass, let's say, the contribution uh, from the, the, I mean, the, the, the cross correlation between um, the H1 signal and the galaxy uh, projected density, for example. And for doing that, you need to have a very, uh, you need to control the mass range over which you do the integral. But uh, as I was saying before doing this, we had no idea of what mass to uh, employ. Of course, this is um, what, what we're doing here is assuming it, this is representative of one type of halo, which has a mass, which is the mean uh, of the mass that we, of everything that goes into the stack. But yes, of course, it's a good, uh, it's a good point. Yeah. And how about the, the dependence of this real mass you have on the H1 to halo mass relation that also, I mean, there is not one unique relation. No, indeed, no. Uh, actually, uh, when you go to high masses, these kind of scaling tend to be largely un unconstrained. And there are, there are different uh, possibilities in the literature here. What we were using was um, a scale, uh, scaling that was fitted. Uh, well, let's say it was uh, uh, computed from abundance matching at low redshift between uh, the um, halo mass function and uh, the uh, H1 mass function obtained from high pass galaxies and alpha alpha galaxies. Uh, so we found that it was a good choice because it, it doesn't rely on many assumptions. It, it was at low redshift. Uh, well, the, the results are in, in the paper uh, Padmanabhan and Kulkarni 2017. That is the one that we're using. But of course, uh, there are many other choices. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the talk. Let's uh, move on. Uh, in the interest of time with uh, Mel, Mel is here fun. Hi, Mel. Hey. So Mel is from the University of Western Cape and uh, she's going to tell us about uh, MIRCLAS, the large area 21 centimeter intensity mapping serving with MIRCAT. Go Mel. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm Mel Erfan and I'm a postdoc at UWC and also Queen Mary in London. And yes, I'm going to be talking about the single dish 21 centimeter intensity mapping experiment in MIR class. So um, we are currently observing using 64 of the Meerkat dishes. So I know that in, in the future, I think up to uh, just uh, over 80 dishes will be available for use, but there are 64 and we're currently using 64 dishes. And the idea is to do uh, a low angular resolution, large um, sky area uh, H1 intensity mapping survey. So we're looking at around 4,000 uh, hours of observation, um, looking at 4,000 square degrees on the sky. Um, and thanks to the, the MeerKat receivers, we actually have the opportunity to uh, measure in both uh, L-band um, and also at UHF-band. Uh, so uh, we will be measuring at somewhere between 0 and 1.45 in uh, redshift. Um, but it's part of our commissioning process to, um, to choose which frequency band will, is best suited um, for our final requirements. Um, we have taken observational data already. We took about 11 hours um, in 2019 at L-band. And uh, again, about four months ago, we took uh, essentially about another 50 hours um, on the sky again um, at L-band. Um, so the primary goal of, of MIR class is a, a direct measurement of the BAO. Um, so we'll be making also correlation uh, power spectra of the integrated um, H1 temperature. So what I'm, plus, uh, what I'm showing here are expectations um, for the measurements and errors that, that we expect to see for um, 
a survey done uh, with the 64 dishes um, across 4,000 um, hours and 4,000 square degrees. We will also be doing observations um, across uh, areas of the sky that, that overlap with existing optical galaxy surveys. So we should have, be able to do cross correlations um, with uh, spectroscopic surveys, um, photometric surveys, and also lensing maps. Um, what's quite unique about um, MIRCLASS is that um, we are a single dish intensity mapping uh, experiment, um, but we are operating on um, a uh, the Meerkat telescope array, which is set up as an, as an interferometer. So um, we are using each of the single dishes in their autocorrelation modes, so zero spacings, um, and we're possibly doing a single dish intensity mapping because that's going to get us to the, the BAO scales. But we have the ability to also uh, collect the interferometer data simultaneously. So um, we also have uh, the higher resolution data uh, in order to, to have a look at uh, extragalactic point sources and uh, we're measuring obviously in Stokes I, uh, but also in polarization. So we can also look at polarized point sources. Mm. So um, one of the interesting bit of um, commissioning works that was required to be done at the beginning of the project um, was um, we needed to properly understand our uh, non-thermal noise characteristics. So something that um, single dish intensity mapping experiments uh, suffer from, or actually single dish radio experiments suffer from, is a one over F noise. So this is noise that is correlated in the time ordered uh, data. Um, so that's uh, noise that's correlated over, over time. So this isn't thermal noise. And uh, it kind of behaves like uh, gain fluctuations, uh, has the same effect. So if you make a, a map out of a TOD that are um, that have one of ref noise, what you're going to end up with is, um, are streaks in your map. So you're going to end up with large scale spatial features that are not actually present on the sky, but they're due to your instrument. So this uh, this time correlated noise uh, um, can also be correlated over frequency as well. And that's what I'm showing. Uh, you can see the, the equation there is for the, the, the 2D power spectral form of uh, one of ref noise. Um, basically, we wanted to know if this was a showstopper for us or not. So um, we did about two and a half hour observation at uh, the South Celestial Pole. That's a, it's an area that's known for having low foreground contamination. And we, we observed and we used uh, the raw data. So what I'm, what's being plotted is the raw data at 900 megahertz. Um, so you have the, the 2D power spectra there, so the, the Fourier transform in frequency and time. Uh, and over plotted onto that, are the cosmological scales that we're, we're interested in, in looking at. And you can see that it's not being swamped out by one over F noise. So the one over F noise is sticking to uh, low values of F and low values in tau. Um, so we, we learned from this is no, it's not a showstopper. And also the one over F noise starts to dominate over the thermal noise uh, level at time scales of around tens of seconds. And we actually use this to um, inform our, um, our, our strategy that we use for, for data calibration, which I should talk about next. Um, so the pilot survey, which you can see uh, down there at the bottom, the area that we're looking at actually overlaps with the Wiggle Z 11 um, hour field to allow for cross correlations. And um, you can see the scan scanning strategy that we're using uh, there on the right. So we're doing raster scans, we're holding the telescope at a constant high elevation scanning house. Our data reduction, our calibration pipeline, it had uh, it has two big jobs. The first of which is RFI flagging. So we suffer greatly from, from RFI as I think everybody does hearing about it in this conference. Um, and essentially um, the, the, the pipeline uh, is responsible for flagging um, our RFI. Um, so the brightest RFI contamination you see is from the satellite, and you can see the channels that are, that are cut out there in the, in the plot at the top. We are observing at around deck zero, and we believe that um, as we start to observe different areas, the severity of the, the satellite RFI problem should, should lessen. And the second function of the data reduction and the calibration pipeline is to um, take our data from raw instrumental units into, um, into Kelvin. And the way that we do that is um, our observational block is around uh, 90 minutes in length. So, um, and we observe known calibrators. So we use calibrator sources and we also use noise diodes. So in the, in the 90 minute observation, we will observe a, a known calibrator source at the beginning uh, of the uh, scan and at the end of the 90 minute scan. 
And we will also fire noise diodes um, every 20 seconds throughout the scan. And they will sort of be our in-house calibrators when, when we're not observing a point source. So what we want to do is we want to fit a model of our system temperature to determine the gain. And the gain is the, the factor that's going to get you from instrumental units into Kelvin. Um, so you can see uh, we, have, we, have a, we have a model for the, the, the calibrator source um, because it's got known flux density. In order to get that into uh, temperature, we need to have a model for the beam. We're using the Assad et al. Hot, um, holographic um, measurement of the Meerkat beam. The plot up there on the top left is showing the various models that you can use. We're using the one in blue. Um, I think the takeaway point is just that um, when you're close to the center of the main beam, it, it doesn't really matter uh, what model you use, but as you start to move out and get slide loads, it, it does really matter. Um, so we have a model for the, the, the calibrator. We have a, a model for the diffuse galactic emission we're using the Python Sky model. And um, we have a model for our elevation dependent uh, temperature contribution. So stuff like ground spillover and stuff like um, atmospheric capacity. And what we want to do is we want to fit um, for the noise diode temperature and average receiver temperature and these get factored. Um, but now when we do the actual survey, we're not observing um, uh, the point source anymore, but we have our noise diode and um, temperatures fixed um, from, from where they were uh, at the beginning of the scan and at the end of the scan. Um, so we can use a fixed noise diode and we just fit for the gain and um, we fit this time for a receiver temperature that, that's allowed to smoothly vary over time. And what's being shown up there in the top, uh, on the top uh, right is a residual plot. So there you can see the, um, the temperature uh, residual between our system temperature, uh, our model in Kelvin, and um, our actual um, raw data that's been calibrated into Kelvin. And you can see a good agreement to within three sigma of the, the theoretical noise level. Now at the bottom there, I'm showing uh, one of our sky maps. So this is um, this is a roughly one gigahertz, and it's putting together all the dishes and all the observation blocks. Um, and the the the, the points are highlighted in magenta. So now that we had our, our beautifully um, calibrated and RFI free cube um, of, of pilot data for 2019, um, one of the, the the things we thought we would um, have a look at is the brightest thing that's in there, which is of course um, a foreground and it's diffuse uh, galactic synchrotron emission. So we thought it would be a fun project to try and measure the spectral index. So we are using the parameterization that you can see at the top there, the equation at the top, which is um, that the synchrotron emission is modeled as a power law, and that power law is, has a spectral index, which changes over, um, uh, changes both spatially, so over pixels, and, and spectrally over frequency. Um, so the first analysis we did was um, the TT plots. So this is temperature temperature plots, and these are essentially uh, linear um, re uh, regression. So the idea is if you have um, two data sets that are looking at the same emission on the sky, and they're both at different frequencies, what they see is going to be strongly correlated, and you can do a straight line graph, and the gradient of that straight line fit is going to tell you about the spectral index. So this is an average spectral index um, across that frequency range and across the pixels that, that you have uh, in there. Two, two minutes left. OK, cheers. Um, and um, yeah, so, so we picked three of the Meerkat um, channels, and um, we wanted to make comparison with ancillary data. Um, and thankfully, there's publicly available data from OBRO LWA and also the 45 megahertz all sky map. Um, so we smoothed the Meerkat data to the appropriate re uh, resolutions to make this comparison, um, found nice, um, nice strong correlations, fitted the spectral indices, and you see a, a, a nice agreement within our own analysis of the spectral indices of around minus 2.7 between 45 megahertz and um, about a gigahertz. And that's also in good agreement with um, values that, that currently exist in the literature. But this is average beta right now, so um, no, no spectral index coverage. So the next bit was to, to extend this a bit and to look at um, spectral energy distributions, so SEDs. So now um, we've got the LWA data still. We're putting in many, many more mere class channels. So we've got about 500 mere class channels. And you, you can see the wealth of information they're adding to the, to the, from the inserts on those plots there. We've also got the Hausland data. And the idea now is to, to have a look at um, how the flux density changes over frequency and fit for the spectral uh, index value at 73 megahertz and um, the level of curvature that you're going to see 
over frequency. So we picked three regions on the sky, three apertures, and you've got um, circles with roughly beam size radius. Um, and so you have three SEDs, one for each of those regions. Um, and we're fitting for the, the, spectral, the spectral index and the curvature. And that's what I'm showing here. So, um, so now that we have the, the form that the spectral index takes and, and the, the level of curvature that it's going to have, we can make predictions for the spectral index at various frequencies. So what we have is the, the spectral index at 73, 408, and 980 megahertz. And um, you can see uh, the, the mere class analysis is in red. And we, again, managed to compare this with ancillary data um, thanks to edges and arcade 2 um, a CMB balloon born experiment. So again, we see strong agreements with this one sigma. So all of this has been done on around 11 hours worth of, of pilot data. So we've successfully verified our calibration pipeline. We've had a bit of a probing of the ISM and we, are, we actually have some uh, a cross correlation analysis. So that's Steve's talk that's coming up in about an hour's time, which is gonna be really interesting. So this is not really a conclusion, but just to say that there's um, many more interesting things to come. From my class. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mel. That was great. Uh, we already have um, a question from Simon Foreman. So, hi, Melis. You should forecast for me class cross correlated with DES galaxies or DES lensing. I'd, I'd expect that the loss of low K parallel modes due to program cleaning would severely degrade the signal to noise of these cross correlations. Since projected traces like photo Z galaxies are mostly sensitive to these low K parallel modes. Is this effect included in these forecasts? Um, I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I'm, I'm, I'm I don't think uh, that they are. So I would have to check to get back um, to you about the, the, the foreground cleaning um, that was assumed, the level of foreground, the magnitude of foreground that was assumed to do this. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd have to get back to you and write on the Slack. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Thank you both. Re remember, you can keep posting questions on, on, on Slack. But now, uh, to, to, to be on time, let's move on uh, with uh, Carolina and Eka. Um, can you share your screen? So Carolina is from the University of Hamburg. And she's going to tell us about learning the 21 centimeter signal from sources to Topography, tomography and back. Okay, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, hi everyone, and uh, thanks a lot to the organizers and also my fellow participants um, for making this uh, an interesting and, and lively conference week. So, um, I'm down right in with the learning part here. So, in this talk, uh, not, not generally, but in this talk, uh, by learning, I will mean deep learning. And I'd like to start by motivating this. So um, as we all know, we have upcoming large scale and high resolution surveys. Um, of course, already the precursors are doing an amazing job. And for example, for the 21 centimeter line, we all know the SKA is kind of, um, well, hopefully waiting for us um, around the corner. So we kind of want to have efficient data reduction automation and also well, mine the data in the best way possible. And here, well, there has been a rise not only in, in our intense mapping or to know centimeter business, but generally, I think, in astrophysics of deep learning. And this is partly or mainly, maybe one could also say, driven by the ability of uh, these um, methods to improve the performance with increasing amounts of data. Um, but not only that, uh, and uh, we'll come back to this. So especially for intensity mapping, um, this can be kind of a, a nice match. So if on the astrophysical side, we, we take intensity mapping and we compare or match this with a computer vision, AI and deep learning, both approaches are basically a pixel by pixel based approach that um, takes imaging or tomography and maps, which kind of can, can be fused together, I think, on top of, of all the machinery that we already have um, and trying to create novel scientific life cycles that can complement what um, all the hard work that we've been already or are doing um, in our fields. So we, we have seen some different versions of this um, in the last days. Um, I'm just coming back to this here that, well, to measure, for example, and push boundaries to the high redshift regime of reinization, we can um, hunt for, for sources individually, which though is kind of biased to, well, 
those souls are sitting in the, in the visualized halos that are for example, the most bright or the most lens or whatever. So the, well, we can't pick up all the, those sources down there. But of course, if we move to intensity mapping, what we can do is to just pick up all the light and also the light from the, the gases media in between. And we can do this in multiple lines. Of course, um, 21 centimeter is, is very important there. Um, here I'm showing lime and alpha. And what is also nice to be done is to match these together as um, you also have seen in the previous cross correlation session. These different lines can be very much complementary to each other. For example, with lime and alpha tracing more the ionized sources and 21 centimeter intensive mapping tracing at high rates of ionization. The, the neutral hydrogen. So on top of that, well, it's nice to have different lines um, tracing different media, but also the source detection and uh, intensity mapping it's in itself is very much kind of crossing each other in their pros and cons. So what's the, the pros for the source um, uh, characterization is kind of the con for the intensity mapping and vice versa. So it's, it's very, I think, natural to use them together um, jointly or cross-correlate them, which has some advantages in order to, to gain the information, uh, to, to maximize the information that we gain. And as a little detour, um, of course, if we want to have intensity mapping that's not 21 centimeter, that though matches well all the, the precursors that we have, we have ongoing in 21 centimeter science, as well as the, the upcoming SKA, we might ask how do these, these mappings have to look like? So we want to be wide field in a way to map out large scales, but we also have certain requirements on our resolution to have a good overlap with 21 centimeter intensity mapping. So there's, there's more details in, in the study here, but uh, what we find is that we can have, for example, a very moderate requirement on the spectral resolution that we can use to push us basically up above the 21 centimeter wedge to have a nice overlap region between other line intensity mapping and, and our 21 centimeter intensity mapping. And to consistently model this um, and to finish my little tour, I advocate basically to model all of this in a fast and consistent framework to explore our full model space. And to do so, I match together 21 centimeter um, seminomic simulations based on 21 centimeter fast with key galaxy properties in order to simulate very different scales. And here I'm basically showing a composite image where in Lyman Alpha, I have the more galactic contribution that's very centered in the middle of our, our halos then the more extended diffuse IgM um, contribution and the more scattered IgM. And this is for a redshift of, I think this was nine in this model. Um, but this can also be done for other lines and uh, relatively fast still. And um, so here I'm just showing another example, H alpha that's very much more dominated even than lime alpha, which is more scattered to the, the galactic contribution. And we can already, when we look at these images, see that um, there's a large variety and kind of, um, well, they're complementary to each other. They're very different in their fuzziness and their scales. So this brings us back to deep learning, where deep learning basically has the ability to learn representations. And by learning representations, I mean, it can detect objects, it can characterize them, which is a little bit different to what we do, for example, when we apply a power spectrum, at least a spherically average one, very, in the end, Gaussianize this picture and what we try to infer from it. So this idea of learning representations comes in the end from neuron response to visual stimuli studies in the, I think in the 60s they started, where it turned out that the way we pick up visual stimuli is by detecting very simple shapes locally, and then we match them together to create and assemble more complex structures. And this is basically what inspired convolutional neural networks that just operate in the same way. And we now try to employ this exactly for the 21 centimeter enhanced mapping light cones or tomographic cubes that we're expecting and that we're already starting to create nowadays. So here is such a light cone for the epoch of reunization. In blue, we have the reunization epoch and also in uh, yellow, red, we have the, the heating epoch before that. And to tackle such a light cone, one can 
well, think of it in kind of different philosophies or different ways. One can look at it as like a series of 2D images or like a full time series or like as a full 3D object. And when treating this type of um, light clone, it turned out for us that if we use different types of network architectures that fit the data structure, the best performing one is uh, a full 3D network, a full 3D convolution, where we basically convolve down this full light cone into, into smaller 3D boxes in the end. And we then have um, an inference part of the network that answers the questions we're asking in the end. And for us, this question was in this um, first study, can we infer joint, jointly properties that uh, describe the cosmology, cosmic dawn, and realization properties of these light cones? And uh, we can, yes, very well for most of the parameters. Um, so I'm kind of highlighting here that we can infer with the networks the prediction against our ground truth that we know simulated in this case. Uh, very well with like a small scatter. For example, for omega m, we have um, a scatter here that's smaller than one percent. Warm dark matter, which was the second cosmological parameter we looked at, turned out to be a bit more tricky. And above uh, masses for four keV, we have actually problem inferring it, which is in line with other measurements like the Lyman alpha forest. So it turns out this is the most tricky part to measure. And if we look actually at increasing levels of uh, contamination of noise in our light cone that we model, most parameters, the network can basically um, make up for that. So it can still infer the parameters as well. But only for for one that matter, it turns out small scales that are washed out are very much crucial um, to determine the mass as well. So we get discrepancy in these histograms between um, the three different colors mentioned the three different assumptions here on our noise levels. But mostly this performs well. And uh, just to highlight this, um, or how, how cool actually the network samples can, let's say, inter or extrapolate, it's, it's a bit deba uh, debatable, but uh, well, so we cross-trained between only simulations, no noise, and simulations with noise. And what we find is that for some parameters, the network can um, transfer really well so it doesn't really care if it was trained just on the signal or on the noise plus signal. It can always vice versa infer, infer the parameters without any like, increase in scatter or any bias. But this is not true for all parameters. So for example, on the top here for omega matter, we see that if we train on a noiseless simulation and we apply it to a light cone plus noise, we get an increased scatter, which is not too bad either. But if we go the other way, so we say, okay, we have a good noise model, we train our network on a light current plus noise, and then we go to the bare model, we actually get a large bias. So one needs to be careful here and understand really um, how one can well, manage um, different levels of noise that come in that maybe we didn't expect. I mean, okay. we infer. Thank you. When we infer parameters. And um, just one last point, which I think is interesting, when we look at the saliency maps, this basically tells us where is the network looking at, mostly to infer the parameters that we're asking it of. Um, when we look at simulations, the networks kind of basically look everywhere. When we look at mocks, they very much focus on the transition um, times. So the transition from uh, dark ages to the early heating, from heating to reunization and the end of reunization. And this is very much similar to the Fisher information content that we find when we do for a simple Fisher forecast, for example. Um, which in a way is good because it matches our expectations, at least in the presence of noise. So as a last um, quick point, I would like to come back to the sources actually. So this is at low redshift now. This is at something around 0.5 in redshift. And we now want to detect objects in our, again, 3D data structures of H1 or the 21 centimeter signal. So here we look at the data cube that was provided during the SKA science data challenge, the second one, in order to search for H1 sources and characterize them. Um, there are some pitfalls of that, low signal to noise, small spatial skies, uh, size, um, lots of relatively many systematic still present as residuals in the cube. And here I just show the very brightest source out of 100,000 in this cube as an example. And just um, 
What I'd like to highlight here is that if we take uh, cutouts around sources, the method that worked best for us in terms of networks was again a 3D network that just tries from the cutout to derive a 3D segmentation where it thinks the galaxies are situated or the, the H1 sources. And we, if we convolve this with the original cutout, we basically get a noiseless image of the galaxy in 3D. And this then in the end turned out to give us very good estimates of the flux and the H1 size of uh, these H1 sources. Um, there's some more work to be done, undoubtedly. Um, and um, this is a very, very interesting first um, demonstration. But um, well, yeah, there's, there's lots to do in terms of network um, characterization and pre-training. So to uh, summarize this, I think both intensity mapping, also of multiple lines, and deep learning are on their own and also together very interesting methods to constrain astrophysics and cosmology, um, pushing boundaries to up to high redshift. And I think what will be cool in the next years is to develop, well, better error estimates, um, actually test this better on, on data that we start to have, and um, also to have a really multi-line setup where we can, in, in multiple colors, test the universe jointly. And uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you. So questions. Okay, Simon, Simon's really quick. Uh, we like that. So, hi, Caroline. Have you thought about how to handle residual systematic foregrounds in the data in a machine learning approach? So, we haven't thought it about foreground cleaning. Um, if this is um, what, what you mean, yes. Um, unfortunately, no. So, if we go, for example, to the SKA challenge, uh, if I can go back. Um, so, what we see is actually that the networks can do very well getting rid of the noise or really badly, depending on how you train them and with what um, set. So I suspect we could also use something like this on a larger scale for, for like full sky maps to, to clean away noise. Um, I think there's some work so started to do full sky map cleaning with networks, but we, we haven't tried it yet, unfortunately. Um, but I think it, it would be a cool thing to test aside uh, besides all the, the other approaches we've been seeing, like um, CA or mixed stream CA and, and other approaches, and, and compare how, how this performs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, following uh, Simon's question, I don't know if, like, I, I also had sort of the same question, but um, not regarding foreground cleaning itself, but um let's say that uh, you already have um performed some foreground cleaning on your cube but you still have some residual foregrounds so but because at some point you were talking about robustness against noise so i assume that noise was like a white noise but if you have something more structured if you yes actually the for example, in the SKA challenge now, there, there was still some structure, yeah, like some residual beam structure um, that had been modeled, um, results of the sky model and of like results of the RFI cleaning that, that had been in there. And actually there was part of the, the problem, but also, well, so it partly led to another networks misidentifying some of these residuals as being actual sources, actually. Um, but on the other hand, if you did a clever pre-training of networks, it turns out you can push down these false positives a lot. So basically you need to really show the network what, what is like the real sources and what is like, like a beam residual. But then again, you need like a good simulation, yes. Um, so my hope would be from the other study where we have seen that actually going from simulations to noise works better than going from let's say a wrong level of noise back to simulations, that this kind of, it could happen that they, they can generalize well also in this direction, also for this study. Um, but um, so for this, for, for the source detection, this really depends a lot on how you pre-train and how you choose your training set. Um, this is very sensitive, yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you and thank, uh, let's thank all the speakers um, and I think that now we can have a break and uh, we can reconvene in uh, uh, 
12 minutes, so we can start at uh, the hour sharp and uh, be back as, as, as planned. So thank you everybody and have a nice little break. Thank you. I was about to ask if you wanted to uh, test your slides, Seth. Um, all looks good. We're seeing your cursor and we're seeing your slides. Um, do you have any videos? Great. Uh, no, I don't have any videos. All good then. Okay, thanks. Peter, are you there? Still, or have you gone to make a cup of coffee? Nope, I'm here. I'm just going to test sharing the video purely because I can't play it in QuickTime Player, so I've got to use VLC and I just want to check it all works. Okay, yeah, let's do that. So, you can you see my cursor? I'm interested. Yep. Yeah. Okay. You know what I haven't done? I haven't followed my own advice. <laughs> Optimize the video clip. Oh, oh now, oh, right. Right, there we go. There we go. Which is a consultant college. The, the bottom is cut, but I think it's from the video, right? I'd like to thank all the organizers for giving me an opportunity. Uh, to what the... Spotlight. And my talk is about what if I do that? What if I do maps. that? Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, I think it's better. There's still a little piece oh, that's missing, yeah, but no. I think it's just from the video. Oh, wait, sorry, I assumed you meant could you, um, can you see the gray bars? Yeah, you must be able to see the gray bars because it's showing yeah. VLC. Yeah, no, I think it is just a video. Okay, I, does it? Oh, I don't think. Oh, it doesn't last. Yeah, okay. it, it's, it's just the very bottom of the uh, PDF. So it's, so. Why do I keep pushing full screen, full screen instead of close? <laughs> I think yeah, my brain just, just turned to video, soup. And it is definitely, that bit's just cut off in the video, so it's fine. Okay, cool. Yeah, all right, no, that works. So I just wanted to, wanted to double think. check that would all work all yeah. right. Cool. It's better to check. Thanks. <laughs> uh, no worries.
Should I start sharing my screen? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Cool background. Thank you. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. I think uh, we can start. So yes, now we have uh, Ian Oti from Imperial College London, and uh, he will tell us about synergies between interferometers and future surveys to study the end of the EOR. Go Ian. Thank you, Isabella. Um, so yeah, so synergies between interferometers and, and future surveys study the end of the epoch realization. Uh, so to start off with, uh, you know, as probably preluded to many talks this week. You know, we are yet to detect the uh, the 21 centimeter signal, uh, but we have a few probes. Uh, we have a few upper limits to kind of rule out uh, warm uh, dark matter uh, realization, sorry, warmer uh, realization. Uh, but we do have indirect constraints on the epoch realization. Uh, so from Planck, we can say that uh, realization uh, must have started uh, after a redshift of uh, uh, 14. And from uh, on this kind of right plot here, uh, which is the, uh, you know, Thanatel plots from a dozen or so quasar spectra uh, and how the prominence of the, of the uh, Gambierson trough forces with redshift. Uh, with this plot, we can say that realization must have finished by redshift of six. But as we've got uh, more uh, spectra, so notably from Becker and, and Bosman et al. Uh, and so as we get more quasar spectra, we see that the Lyman alpha optical depths are highly fluctuating, uh, implying there is a great variability in the uh, in the spectra of quasars. And, and there's a few possible explanations for it. The, the two that make the most noise are a non-uniform ultraviolet background, uh, which is uh, indicative of having, you know, a lot more rare bright sources than we would expect. And the second is a late reionization. So you have more neutral islands uh, towards the end of reionization. In reality, it appears to be both of these plus something non-trivial um, extra. But let's focus on the, the late reionization. And so again, um, Becker et al. 2021 showed that the Lyman alpha uh, mean free path increases by an order of magnitude as we go from a redshift of six to a redshift of five. Uh, and, and in line with that, uh, Kane et al. showed like as far as an upper limit uh, neutral fraction, a uh, redshift of 5.9 is 12% is uh, neutral fraction. And then Quinn et al. Uh, using 21 CMC and observational data constrain the end of reionization uh, to a redshift of 5.3. So all of this in hand, you know, the, the previously, I guess, not so interesting period of the epicorinization, this kind of redshift of six to five range is now in fact very interesting because uh, there, there is now an abundance of evidence showing that we have a much later uh, reionization. Uh, but this is problematic for, for a lot of interferometers, especially because they stop observing at redshift of six or the kind of high band antennas that they have are not optimized uh, for uh, frequencies above uh, 200 megahertz. And so I wanted to look at potential and, and future prospects for, for cross correlations when it comes to the epoch realization. Um, Alkistis said it yesterday, and, and I'm sure Steve will say it next, which is lower redshift studies have an abundance of optical surveys at their hand that they can easily do cross correlations with, with their single dish experiments. And we're not so fortunate uh, to do that uh, with the epoch realization. Uh, you know, all, the, all these surveys that have come online, Euclid, Roman, and uh, Vera Rubin, uh, you know, they, they don't extend to, or they don't overlap with uh, SKA's observational redshifts. And so I will focus on, on the prospects of doing so, and I'll be, be 
be looking at cross correlations. Again, this is the R coefficient, uh, where uh, a one is 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 uh, correlated and minus one one is completely anti-correlated. And I'll be focusing on um, SIMFAST 21, so semi-analytical uh, simulation to do this, uh, to look at these prospects. <clears throat> so for the most part, uh, cross correlations in terms of theory have been performed uh, with respect to coeval cubes, which are at the same redshift uh, and at the same neutral fraction uh, in the context of EOR. In reality, we're going to be observing light cones, and light cones will evolve in both redshift and neutral fraction. And so this evolution is a second order effect to our uh, cross correlations. And more recently, in fact, just this year, Murmu et al, uh, they, they looked at this comparison uh, where they compared coeval cubes and, and light cones uh, on an end body simulation and found that there were significant differences. So what's the prospects then? I mean, are, are light cones still good to use or, or, or not? So before we can say definitively, what would we expect to see from these cross correlations? Well, at the large scale, so the low KN, we hope to see kind of an anti-correlation, especially if we're assuming to look at the kind of end of realization with 10% neutral fraction. We would expect to see an anti-correlation. And then as we go to intermediate scales, we see some sort of turnover indicative of the typical bubble size. And then at the high K end of our correlation, uh, we would probably probe uh, internal galaxy structure. Now I'm using SIMFAST, it doesn't exactly have a prescription for galaxy structure. So we're not going to be seeing anything at high K, but you know, we're hoping to see this kind of expected structure at, at the low K. <clears throat> uh, so on the right here, I show, um, so this is 130 uh, megaparsec in terms of our angular domain. And so I show, a two coeval cubes at 10% and 13.5% and uh, cross correlations. And then my light cone in black has a 5% evolution. So it's between uh, uh, a neutral fraction of 10% to a neutral fraction of uh, 5%. And then the double in red is between a neutral fraction of 15% and a neutral fraction of 5%. And what you see with the with the kind of 5%, we, we see this odd structure here where we start seeing this um, peaking occurring at, at low k scales <clears throat> whereas when we double the bandwidth it seems to be uh, it seems to go and what um sorry uh, what i think this is likely due to is because of the two line of sight differences so the line of sight distance of of the kind of of the black is much smaller than the typical coval cubes and so this effect might likely be due to the fact that our line of sight distance is quite limited, but this is to be investigated. <clears throat> As we go to a higher size of, of um, so this is again, focusing on a 15% to 5% neutral fraction. As we go to larger uh, sizes, uh, we, you know, we start getting access to lower K. And the kind of conclusion here uh, that I'd make is that it seems like kind of light cone cross correlations are, are still good to do, but we need to make sure we have a large enough uh, a bandwidth or uh, to ensure that we don't see this kind of peaking effect potentially that I still need to investigate. And so because I, I predominantly focus on, on foreground removal, uh, I wanna see what prospects we have for, for foreground mitigation now that we're kind of happy with, with cross correlations with light cones. And um, as, also mentioned in Isabella's talk as well, uh, techniques like GMCA and FASTACA that are more component based. So this is from my, my paper. Because they are scaled uh, independent, so they model the same number of components at every scale, often at the kind of high K end of our power spectrum, they can't capture the instrumental effects. And so I, I want to ask the question of, okay, say if we can apply you know, these techniques uh, very weakly such that we just remove a bit of the foregrounds and then cross correlate will we be able to detect the underlying R coefficient so i first want to start out with assuming perfect foreground removal and so if we assume we've perfectly removed foregrounds and we just have noise 
Um, and to give a context, uh, so the, the noise I simulate is Gaussian noise and the sigma value here, which I base off of the 21 centimeter signals, uh, sigma value is, is the sigma used for the, for the Gaussian noise. And so sigma, so 5.83 millikelvin is roughly 600 hours of um, SK observation noise and 10 sigma would be six hours of SK observation noise. And what you can see is, you know, even though there's a small deviation, across correlating even with kind of six hours of SK noise, we can, we can very well recover the underlying um, R coefficient. So what happens if we, if we add uh, noise to the, sorry, foregrounds to the mix? And so I simulate foregrounds and you can see the rough order of magnitude for the kind of different cases where in one case, it's almost the foregrounds that we observe that are at 10 to the three uh, millikelvin. And then the next is assuming we've removed an order of magnitude of foregrounds and then two orders of magnitude, three and, and so forth. And what you see is kind of expected for two cases here where we have, again, the 600 hour noise and then the six hour noise. If we, if we don't remove our, our uh, foregrounds, we, we kind of get within the error bars, we kind of get this like no correlation uh, so as, it, as it goes towards uh, the kind of red line. But if we've removed just an order of magnitude of noise, I mean, even in, in the 10 sigma uh, noise case, we can recover our underlying uh, R coefficient. And so if we can get really good, uh, again, uh, so this is assuming like a perfect uh, galaxy catalog, but if we can get a really good galaxy catalog that, that kind of overlaps with SK's observations, we can, we can perform these cross correlations with very weak a foreground removal and still recover the underlying uh, R coefficient. To conclude, uh, cross correlations can be a powerful probe as it can tell us a lot about uh, the morphology of the 21 centimeter signal. Cross correlations can be used for uh, foreground mitigation, uh, as I've just shown. And there's a few things that I want to investigate further. So the first is that 12% at register for 5.9 was an upper limit. Say if in reality, the neutral fraction is only one or two percent. Is that enough to do cross correlations? Is there a point where cross correlations really become meaningless? Um, and if so, you know, at what at what neutral fraction would that be? The second is what kind of survey would we need to have to overlap with SKA? Would it be, you know, of of the power and sensitivity of current experiments, or do we need to go even deeper uh, to look at these galaxies? And lastly, are we able to use uh, the R coefficient, you know, almost like changing 21 CMC, uh, but with the likelihood being the kind of R coefficient to see if we can uh, constrain astrophysical parameters? Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. That was really clear. Are there questions? And while people type their questions. I have one. Um, so when you show the, the, the foregrounds, uh, like the level of the foregrounds. Yeah. So here you're assuming that you actually do the, 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 the simulation and remove the foregrounds or, or this uh, 10 to the three millikelvin to the two millikelvin is an injection of uh, yeah, foreground. It's, it's an injection of foreground. It's because the, the Bandwidth used here is only like eight megahertz, and so obviously the GMC and fast ACA perform absolutely not so good on it. Okay. Uh, the idea would for this would be obviously you you would I think you showed it's all right if you, you you know you you need to have as much bandwidth as you can get and frequency channels to to properly perform. Yeah, because my guess is that it, it in not only this this exercise would not only depend on how much foregrounds you remove, but the the key dependence of the, the residual foregrounds that you have. Yeah, exactly. No, I agree. I mean, yeah, this, this, is, this is just a toy example. I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I was planning on, I'm currently simulating an actual like kind of SKA simulation to then do this exercise. And I'm sure it'll be very different, especially the errors as well. Yeah, although, I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And um, well, yeah, one other thing that I noticed is that this, this um, uh, turnover point um, because you have uh, 
this anti anti correlation on the large scales, and then uh, you have actually a, co a positive correlation at the large scales. No, the other way around. Sorry. So you have this turnover point. It is actually stable in many of your cases, uh, like in many of your plots. So I think that is something. Uh, I don't know if it's already investigated by somebody to to use that point as a as a reference for uh, for uh, I don't know. For like but, almost like yeah, I because I, most say that it's like the typical. You, it's kind of where you would expect the bubble size to kind of start. But yeah, no, because these. I mean, it's good because all of these are at roughly the same neutral fraction. So it's. I think yeah, I agree. It's good that it's it's quite stable as well. Like it's not shifting too much. Maybe yeah. maybe there with the because of the noise. I, I guess. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think uh, we can uh, move on with Steve. Uh, Hi, Steve. Yeah, okay. Hey. So Steve Cunnington from the University of Edinburgh, and uh, he's going to tell us about uh, Mirkat H1 intensity mapping cross correlation with overlapping galaxy surveys and redshift of about 0.4. Go ahead. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Isa. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks to everyone for letting me present this today. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be revisiting Meerkat in this talk. There's already been some, some great talks in these conferences on, on Meerkat. So thanks to those people who have done a lot of introductory work already, but um, I'll do a brief introduction anyway. Um, but what I'll be focusing on is the, the latest pilot data that we have with Meerkat. And um, so this is low redshift intensity mapping data. And I'll be focusing on our efforts to try and uh, detect some cosmological, sorry, some cosmological signal within this data. And uh, the way we're trying to do this is by cross-correlating it with overlapping galaxy surveys. Um, so I should mention this is still sort of ongoing work, although it's it's pretty near completion, so it's, it's technically uh, preliminary. But um, yeah, the, the spoiler alert is that it looks like we have a detection, so that's what I'll sort of be presenting today. Um, and I should add, this is sort of work in uh, collaboration with, with everyone in, in, in the Meerkat group. So um, just as a, yeah, some sort of a brief amount of context. So uh, the Meerkat telescope is these, it's, uh, these 64 dishes in the crew desert in South Africa. Um, so it's, you know, like a pathfinder or precursor telescope to the square kilometer array. Um, but it's, it's really kind of a, a state of the art telescope in its own right and uh, we'll be doing cutting edge and is doing cutting edge uh, science so um uh, yeah we're lucky to have it and um so the data that i'll be focusing on today will be uh, within this this l band it's in within within this redshift range but um we've also put forward a proposal to do some further observations in uhf band as well so we have that to look forward to um and the data that we have at the minute is sort of a couple of hundreds uh, Square degrees, um, but going forward in the future, we, we sort of plan to do sort of you know many thousands of uh, square degrees sky surveys. Okay, um, so just it, some people have already mentioned this already. I think Mel touched upon this as well. But I, I wanted to, to mention it as well because it's quite important for the context of these results. So obviously, Meerkat is it's an array of dishes, it's four dishes, and the SK will be many dishes as well. And the reason it's an array is obviously because it's going to primarily operate as an interferometer. Um, the problem for us as uh, large scale structure cosmologists is uh, this, this can have certain limitations. Um, and that's just because the, the SK or Meerkat's design is such that the baselines aren't sufficiently small enough. In other words, the, 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 all these dishes aren't um, tightly packed enough to give us the field of view that we require to access cosmological scales. So things like the BAO scale and beyond, which is you know, really what we're interested in. So uh, in order to get around this kind of uh, slight limitation, we use you know, this, this autocorrelation mode. We autocorrelate the dishes, also what we refer to as single dish mode. So instead of using it as an interferometer, we're using it as 64 or eventually you know, 200 individual uh, scanning telescopes. Um, so I guess the drawback to this is that you you lose some angular resolution because now your you know your maximum baseline, which defines your resolution, is now just given by your dish diameter, which is you know only thirteen or fifteen meters. Um, but the benefits you get is you, you can now access large cosmological scales to you know twenty thousand square degree surveys if you want, 
Um, and you also get the added benefit that it increases your, your observation time because now instead of doing, you know, if you have one night's observation, that suddenly becomes 64 nights of observation because you have 64 telescopes doing work. Okay, um, but yeah, operating in this kind of mode, this single dish mode, this, it, it sort of presents a, a bit of a technological challenge in its own right. So this is something we needed to, to make sure it worked. So um, the sort of earliest effort with, with this data was just making sure we could calibrate maps of the sky. So um, this was using the pilot survey data, and this is what I'll, I'll go on to talk about and how you know, our efforts to detect a cosmological signal within this data. But initially we was, um, well, it was good work led by Jing Yin Wang, just trying to calibrate this data into maps, and uh, which we have successfully done, and Mel touched upon this as well. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this is the data that we have. So it's only about 10 and a half hours of, of data from six nights of observation. Um, but for quite a small amount of data, it still covers a relatively large sort of 200 square degree area. And um, it overlaps with the Wigglesy 11 hour field. And this will be where we get our galaxies from that we cross correlate with. Um, so I mentioned that we, we do this in L band. Um, for the actual data that I'm going on to, to talk about and, and cross correlate with, we only use a, a subset of the, the channels within this data. Um, and that's mainly for RFI reasons. We, we, we choose the channels that are most free uh, of RFI uh, just to give us a, the best chance of making a uh, detection. So the idea is that, so this, this map here is, 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 this won't be H1, this will just be the, the sky. So this is really just a foreground. So the, uh, the next challenge is just trying to get rid of these foregrounds and see if we can detect some cosmological H1 buried underneath. So for the foreground cleaning, that's now the next step. Um, so we're doing a fairly straightforward approach initially, nothing too fancy. We're just doing a principal component analysis based foreground clean of the data. So what these maps are showing here, the one on the left is just the, the uncleaned map. It's gone through some pre-processing steps, but ultimately it's, it's, um, we'll still be showing the foreground. Um, that's why you can see quite a large amplitude by the, this, this color bar. Then on the right, this is cycling through um, different levels of, of foreground cleaning. Um, so this parameter, NFG, um, this is just the, the number of principal components that we're removing from the frequency covariance. So this is, uh, has been shown to be a, a very effective way of doing foreground cleaning. Um, so as this number is going up, you're you know, increasing the aggressiveness of the foreground clean. So uh, that's why you can see the, the amplitude from the map slowly leaking out as you increase this um, aggressiveness. So um, unfortunately, you don't kind of get this for free. You, if, you, if you're having to do a, quite an aggressive foreground clean, which it looks like we, we do have to do this, um, you do get quite a lot of signal loss in the data. So um, this is something that we have to, to correct for to, um, to make sure we don't lose all our, our H1 signal. So to correct for the, the H1 signal loss, we're implementing uh, what's called a foreground transfer function. Um, so this has been a method utilized in, um, as far as I'm aware, all previous attempts at doing a, a cross correlation detection. And uh, the way this process works is you utilize um, mock intensity mapping data. So you create some mocks and you inject those into your, your, your real data. And then you run a foreground clean on this combination of mock and real data. And uh, the idea is because you obviously know how much signal was in that original mock map that you injected. When you do this foreground clean on the combination, you can then cross correlate it with a, um, another mock map. Um, and then take the ratio of the, the power spectrum of this quantity with a foreground free equivalent. And so the idea is the, the amount of signal loss that you, you, you find um, has occurred in your mock intensity mapping data, you use that as a proxy for the amount of signal loss that's occurred in your, your real data. And you can measure this for, for each mode that you're uh, estimating for your real data, and then you use this to construct your signal. And you can do this over a, you know, a, a number of um, mocks. So you take the ensemble average of, of all of those mocks to give hopefully a, a quite smooth transfer function to correct for the signal loss. Okay. Um, so as I said, yeah, to, you know, we're doing this foreground cleaning step, but because it's, you know, we only have a small amount of data, at least 10,500 data, we're still probably trying to understand the telescope as well and our instruments. So um, chances are there's quite a lot of systematics remaining in the data, even after this quite aggressive foreground clean. So to, to make things easy for ourselves, we have a low redshift, we have the, the option of doing these cross correlations with galaxies. 
So um, this was by design. We, we got our pilot survey data to overlap with the Miggle, uh, sorry, Wiggle Z 11 hour field. And uh, these will be the galaxies that we're aiming to cross correlate with. And the idea is obviously these galaxies, the, the, once you bin these galaxies into a map like this, uh, this field will, will not have the, the same systematics that we expect to be in our um, intensity maps. So they should drop out of the cross correlation. So uh, yeah, so these are the, the galaxies bin bin. So, so this is just a, like a number counts field of galaxies. And the idea is we cross correlating this field with our um, final foreground cleaned H1 intensity map. Okay, and so these are the results that we're getting. Um, so the yeah, the plot on the right is showing the, the cross power spectrum between these two fields, so between the Meerkat field and the Wiggle Z galaxies. Um, and so I guess to put it really simply, the idea behind this, if if there was you know no uh, signal in our H1 tensor maps at all, if uh, you know we, we cleaned it all out or we're just too systematic dominated, then that map would not correlate at all with the Wiggle Z galaxies. So you'd get a power spectrum that was just consistent with zero. But um, we're, we're clearly not getting that. We're, we're getting something that is a, a positive cross correlation. Um, this, this works out to be about a uh, seven or eight sigma detection in, um, of a cross correlation. So this is really cool. So because we know that the galaxies obviously trace the, the underlying matter distribution, the fact that this, these H1 tensor maps correlate with that is sort of proof then that we've detected some uh, uh, cosmology. We know that our H1 intensity maps will also trace the underlying matter distribution. Um, so yeah, it, it's worth reminding everyone that this is, you know, for intensity maps that have been constructed using this, this single dish intensity mapping technique, where we have a multi-dish array, but using it in single dish mode. So in that respect, it's, it's sort of a, a first um, detection of its kind. Um, and yeah, as I say here at the bottom, it's, it's, it's really an important milestone for, for um, SK's cosmology, well, SK science goals, because it will really be relying on this single dish intensity mapping technique to, to achieve its large scale structure science goals. So it's, a, it's an important test to pass. So it's, it's looking encouraging. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, this was just a kind of a quick sanity check, I guess, just to make sure nothing strange is happening in our cross correlation. So what I'm showing here is just a null test where um, we take the, the, the mapped galaxies and then we shuffle the, the redshift bins lots of times. And when you do this, you, you should destroy any of the, 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 uh, the, the structure basically in the data. So you should destroy your cross correlation. And indeed we find that we get a, a, um, a, yeah, a power spectrum that's consistent with zero when we do this shuffling. So this is a, a good sanity check, but the signal remains in, obviously in the, in the unshuffled version. So I won't spend long on this because short of time. So this is yeah, my last slide. And um, so what this is showing is, um, so even, so this is just a, a small amount of pilot survey data, it's only 10 hours of data. We can still do some, some fairly good science with it and get some parameter constraints on it. So um, Alkis just talked about this in her review talk. And um, what we're sensitive to is this parameter omega H1, which is the, the abundance of, of neutral hydrogen in the universe. Um, so the reason we're sensitive to this is it's very simple. The, the more H1 there is in the universe, the, the higher our amplitude um, of our power spectrum will be. So just by fitting for the amplitude of our power spectrum, we can get a constraint on, on this quantity. And uh, yeah, these, this is the results that we're getting at the minute. So this is our, the blue point here is for, for our data at um, our particular redshift. And um, I've shown it here in, in the, the context of other constraints in the literature. And it you know, appears fairly consistent with, with what other constraints have, have got at this relatively unconstrained um, region of redshift. Um, but what's really interesting about this constraint is what we're actually sensitive to is the, you know, all, all the parameters that affect the amplitude. So that will also be the, the H1 bias and also the cross correlation coefficient as well. Um, and what we find is if uh, we do some scale cuts to the data, um, we actually change the, you know, the effective amplitude that, uh, that we fit for. So this quantity changes uh, according to scale. Um, so this is quite interesting. It's sort of, it's kind of known that there should be some scale dependence for the H1 bias and the cross correlation coefficient. So either we're kind of seeing signs of this, or it could just be something a little more mundane and that there's some systematics in the data that we're cutting out when we remove large scales, for example, and uh, probe this quantity at, uh, at um, a higher K at smaller scales. So um, yeah, this, this is just cool, but something that we need to, to look into a bit more, I guess. 
So yeah, that was my last slide. So I'll stop there and just sort of leave a few summary slides up. And um, thanks all for listening. If there's any questions, I'll happily take them. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have time for a for a quick question from somebody. Yes, we have uh, Dennis Tamonte. Hi, Steve. Nice talk. You showed the results for the cross correlation with the n equals thirty in the foreground removal. Have you explored the cross correlation with less aggressive PCA approaches? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, yeah, we have explored a, a very large range of different NFG parameters, basically. So we tried going down to as, as little as just removing 10 modes. Um, but unfortunately, just the, the, the power spectrum becomes a lot more noisy when we do that. So this is kind of evidence that um, there's quite a lot of uh, sort of well, residual foregrounds left in the data and probably other system systematics as well that get removed when you do this aggressive foreground clean. So it, it's kind of yeah, indicative that um, that there's, there's a lot of systematics in the data really that we need to rely on this quite aggressive foreground clean. This, this kind of seems to be the most optimal uh, amount that we can that we can do. If we do something lower then, then yeah, the, the results just can't, aren't quite as good. It's a lot more noisy. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, okay. Yes, we move on with Seth, uh, Seth Siegel from McGill University. Yeah, so now we change, uh, we, we, we stay in the low redshift uh, intensity mapping realm, but we switch uh, uh, telescope. So we go with Chime. Thank you, Seth, you can start when you want. Hi everyone. Uh, so yeah, thank you for the opportunity to speak today and thank you to the organizers for making an excellent CESARIC. Uh, my name is Seth, I'm a research associate at McGill University. And in this talk, I'll be providing an overview of a recent detection of 21 centimeter emission from large scale structure between redshift 0 0.8 and 1.4 made with CHIME, the Canadian hydrogen intensity mapping experiment. Uh, this work is described in a manuscript uh, that can be found at this archive ID. Uh, so our analysis cross-correlated CHIME data with the SDSS DR16 EBOS clustering catalogs. We examined three different tracers of large scale structure, uh, emission line galaxies, luminous red galaxies, and quasars, which are split into two fields, the North Galactic Cap and Southern Galactic Cap. I've overlaid the footprint of each field and tracer on a map of the radio sky created from chime data. The chime beam response decreases as one moves toward lower declinations. So we expect to have lower signal to noise for the SGC field than the NGC field. And I'll focus on the NGC field for this work. Um, the figure on the right shows the redshift distribution of each tracer. The grayed out redshift ranges correspond to frequencies that are inaccessible to chime. The quasar catalog has excellent overlap with our frequency range. Uh, the ELGs and LRGs are at a lower redshift and are heavily distributed at the upper edge of our frequency band. For this analysis, we've restricted our attention to frequencies between 585 and 800 megahertz because they're relatively clean of RFI. We used a stacking algorithm in order to correlate the two data sets. The algorithm is conceptually pretty simple. Uh, we first construct a map from the visibility data we use the average visibility over 102 sidereal days. Then we apply a delay filter to each map pixel independently to remove foregrounds. We uh, mask any foregrounds or RFI still present in the residuals. Then for each source in a spectroscopic catalog, we extract a spectral cube from the map that is centered on the source's coordinates and the radio frequency corresponding to its redshift to 21 centimeter mission. This figure illustrates the procedure along the frequency axis. Each panel is the spectrum for the matte pixel closest to a quasar. The red dashed line indicates the frequency corresponding to 21 centimeter emission from the quasar's redshift. The catalogs that we're using have on order tens of thousands of sources in total. The individual spectra are noise dominated. The spectra are shifted so that they line up on the 21 centimeter frequency. We then perform a weighted average over sources. The noise integrates away and the average 21 centimeter emission in the vicinity of the source remains. 
The next few slides show uh, maps of the radio sky constructed from chime data at each stage of the data processing. I'm showing a single 0.4 megahertz frequency channel, and I've zoomed in on the NGC field. The map is dominated by diffuse galactic emission and also uh, bright extra galactic point sources. This is the same frequency and field, but now I've constructed the map from only baselines consisting of feeds on different cylinders. The color scale has been compressed by a factor of 15. The long east-west baselines resolve out the diffuse galactic emission, leaving primarily the emission from extra galactic point sources. We hit confusion noise around 100 millijansky. In order to choose the cutoff for our foreground filter, we examined the delay spectrum of the map, which is shown here. It was created by taking the Fourier transform of the spectrum for each map pixel and then calculating the variance over the right ascension range covered by the NGC field. It's shown as a function of delay on the x-axis and declination on the y-axis. It's been normalized by the delay spectrum of our expected radiometric noise. It delays less than about 250 nanoseconds. Uh, so this, this range, uh, we observe foreground power in excess of our noise. Ideally, all of the foregrounds would live in this bright band centered on zero nanoseconds. However, we observe three additional vertical lines that are due to multipath interference from multiple reflections off the focal line and cylinder. The U-shaped features at higher delays are due to very bright sources in the far side lobes. Uh, at delays outside the dash cyan line, we are reaching the radiometric noise limit. At delays slightly inside the dash cyan line, we're dominated by uh, residuals from bright sources in the far side lobes, but these are fairly localized in the sky and can be easily masked. So we use the solid cyan line for, for the cutoff of our delay filter, which is around 200 nanoseconds or 0.2 H inverse megaparsec. This is the same map after applying the delay filter. Uh, the color scale has been compressed by a factor of 300. There are still residuals. Most prominent are the U-shaped tracks due to very bright sources in the far side lobes, uh, but you also see uh, bright sources in the main lobe. We can compare to a Gaussian noise realization that has variance equal to our expected radiometric noise. Flipping back and forth, you can see we're getting down to the radiometric noise limit for a large fraction of the field. The horizontal lines we, where we see excess noise correspond to declinations where our beam response is low due to destructive interference from multipath. This is the result if we mask all pixels on the map whose magnitude is greater than three times the standard deviation of the expected noise. This discards about 6% of the pixels uh, and results in a map that has an RMS that is within 20% of our expected radiometric noise. But this aggressive mask introduces a significant nonlinearity into the pipeline. So instead, we've used a slight, slightly less aggressive six sigma mask, which throws away 1.4% of the pixels and results in a uh, data processing pipeline that is linear to better than 4%. And this is the map that we stack on. Uh, so here, the top rows display the stack signal along the frequency axis or line of sight direction for the ELG, LRG, and Quasar catalogs. We have a clear detection for all three tracers. The dark gray and light gray contours indicate the central 68, 95% of values observed when stacking the map on 10,000 random mock catalogs and are used to represent the, the noise in the stack. The red line indicates our best fit model, which was obtained by running the stacking pipeline on simulations of the 21 centimeter sky to create a set of templates and then fitting the templates to the data. The signal has this funny shape and that's because it's been convolved with the impulse response of the delay filter, which introduces ringing. We find that the ELGs and LRGs are centered on zero megahertz offset, but the uh, quasars are shifted by 0 0.1 megahertz. Um, and that's measured at roughly three sigma. One possible explanation is an overall bias in the quasar redshifts. And I'll return to this, this point later. The bottom row shows the result of subtracting the best fit model uh, from the data and compares to the gray mock catalog contours. The residuals are consistent with our noise model. The overall detection significance is five to six sigma for the LGs, seven sigma for the LRGs, and 11 sigma for the quasars. We have a high signal to noise uh, measurement for the quasar catalog, so we can further divide it into three redshift bins. 
Uh, the static signal for the three redshift bins are shown here. Again, we have a clear detection with the signal to noise ranging between 6.5 and 7.5. And this allows us to begin examining the redshift evolution of the 21 centimeter signal using a single data set. This figure gives you a rough sense of the scales being probed uh, perpendicular and parallel to the line of sight direction for the three frequencies spanning the range of frequencies included in the analysis. The maximum scales being probed are set by the width of the frequency channel in the uh, direction, in the line of sight direction, and uh, the width of the synthesized beam in the perpendicular direction. The minimum scales being probed are set by the cutoff of the delay filter in the line of sight direction and the uh, 20 meter cylinder width in the perpendicular direction, since we're excluding all of the intra cylinder baselines in the analysis. We note that the first BAO peak is at 0 0.06 H inverse megaparsec. Um, so our foreground filter is effectively removing all of the linear scales that are relevant for the BAO analysis. And this stacking analysis is sensitive primarily to nonlinear scales. So this must be taken into account in any interpretation of the measured signal. In order to interpret the measurement, we've taken a simulation-based forward modeling approach. So for a given set of model parameters, we generate a realization of large-scale structure, and from that construct correlated fields for the hydrogen density and tracer density. We propagate the resulting 21 centimeter realization through a model for the chime transfer function, all the way to visibility time streams using the M mode formalism outlined in Shaw et al. 2015. We then apply the same map making, filtering, and masking um, to the simulation. In parallel, we generate mock catalogs from the tracer density realization and stack the simulated. 21 centimeter observations on each mock catalog. We average over many mock catalogs to obtain the stack signal template for this particular set of model parameters. Um, but this procedure is computationally intensive. It takes about 900 core hours. Uh, so we can't do a full Markov chain um, with this procedure. Uh, instead, we repeat this procedure for seven different combinations of model parameters that allow us to isolate the contributions of individual parameters to the stack signal. We're then able to predict the expected signal quickly and accurately for an arbitrary set of model parameters by taking linear combinations of the 17 templates. In total, there are eight parameters uh, in our model. We list seven of them here and show how varying each alters the cross power spectrum along the line of sight direction, and also the delay filtered stack signal as a function of frequency. The first two rows show the parameters of interest, which are the cosmic density and linear bias of neutral hydrogen. These parameters determine the large scale clustering of neutral hydrogen and the amplitude of the stack signal. The next three rows show what amount to nuisance parameters for this analysis. Um, so you'll have a contribution from correlated shot noise that is sensitive to the mean uh, hydrogen mass per object in the catalog and primarily affects the central bin of the stack. There will also be small scale velocity dispersion of both the hydrogen and tracers that will result in fingers of God damping that will effectively convolve the stack signal with the Lorenzian. And finally, we introduce a parameter to account for uncertainty in the shape of the high K cross power spectrum due to nonlinear gravitational evolution and baryonic effects. So this parameter just smoothly interpolates between a linear matter power spectrum and a model for the nonlinear matter power spectrum. Um, the, the cross power spectrum here does not have the delay filter applied, uh, which will wipe out all scales below roughly 0.25 H inverse megaparsecs. Um, and you can see that in this space, all of the parameters are highly degenerate. So we're not expecting to constrain all eight parameters here. Instead, we're including all of the physical effects that we know about um, so that we can marginalize over them and propagate their uncertainty into the parameters of interest, the uh, density and bias. Uh, so this figure shows the constraints on all eight parameters from an MCMC fit uh, to the stack on the Quasar catalog. We're using non-informative priors for all parameters except for the tracer bias, which is measured well by EBOS. 
Uh, the blue contours denote a fit which, in which the nuisance parameters are held fixed at their fiducial values. And the red contours denote a fit in which they're allowed to vary. So you see this strong banana-shaped degeneracy between the neutral hydrogen density and linear bias. Um, this is removed if we instead look at the product of the bias and density. Um, but that still has a degeneracy with the density itself. Um, and that's because the um, cross power spectrum is proportional to this quantity. So this F mu squared term encodes redshift space distortions due to the Kaiser effect. And it's significant in our analysis because in general, we're sensitive to modes with large uh, mu, which is the cosine of the angle with respect to the line of sight direction. We define this quantity AH1, which we call the clustering amplitude. Um, we then solve for the average value of F mu squared that minimizes the uncertainty on AH1. And we find that that's, that varies from tracer to tracer, but is roughly 0 0.55. So we fix it at that value. And then that's what we place constraints on. Um, that's the primary constraint provided in this, in this paper. And examining the plot, you can see that uncertainty in the modeling of nonlinear scales, which takes you, comparing the blue to the red, um, uh, significantly increases the uncertainty on AH1. Um, but this is not like this is not weakening our detection significance. And then I'll also point out that we'll, while we don't quote the shot noise constraints in the paper, uh, the finite width of this posterior distribution is indicating that this is starting to become interesting and is something we think we can uh, constrain in future analyses. So in order to compare directly to other measurements made by other experiments, uh, we place a more informative prior on the linear bias and then examine the constraints on the density. So we use a simulation-based prior of about 20% um, on the linear bias and the resulting constraints on the density are shown here. So if you first focus on the bottom panel where we've marginalized over the linear parameters only and fix the nonlinear parameters at their fiducial value, each color shows the chime constraints from a different tracer. The quasar catalog is shown in green um, and has been split into three redshift bins. There's good agreement between all of the chime measurements from the different tracers and the total yes. uncertainty uh, due to statistical and systematic errors is roughly 20%. Chime measures a larger value of the density than other experiments, uh, but this can easily be explained by the uncertainty and the nonlinear modeling. So if you look at the top panel that's illustrated here, uh, when we marginalize over the nonlinear parameters, the error bars blow up. Um, and in general, we have consistency with measurements from other experiments um, using a variety of different techniques. Uh, the exception is perhaps the ELGs, which differ at two sigma. And I can go into that in more detail in the question section if people are interested. Uh, so last slide, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're able to constrain a bias in the spectroscopic redshifts of each catalog. So here we've converted the observed frequency offset in the stack to a systematic velocity error. And you can see that the LRGs and ELGs are consistent with uh, no offset, but the quasars are uh, measure a non-zero offset at roughly three sigma when averaged over all redshifts. Um, this is consistent with other measurements of the bias in the quasar redshifts. So here I'm showing uh, work, this is from EBOS. It's comparing the, uh, their quasar redshifts to measurements from the host galaxy uh, stellar absorption lines um, from the host galaxy for a small subset of quasars. And compare, compare the pink uh, markers here to what we measure and they're in general in good agreement. Um, and I think I'm a bit over time, so maybe I'll just leave this summary and outlook slide up and take questions. Thank you, Seth. That actually was uh, really on time. <laughs> um, so yes, there is already one question from uh, Zhao Ting Cheng. Um, so Zhao Ting says, uh, I am confused on how you, to get the power spectrum from the stack signal. Naively, I would imagine distance information is lost. Is there some, is there some underlying assumption for the mock H1 and Galaxy? 
Uh, yeah, so we, let me. Um, we're drawing correlated uh, fields for the H1 density and galaxy density, and then drawing mock catalogs from this, this, uh, this galaxy density field, um, which is correlated, correlated with the underlying 21 centimeter simulation and based off a single realization of large scale structure. Um, and all of this is done in a, a for, we're, we're using a forward modeling um, uh, technique. So we start with like these model parameters tell us what the cross power spectrum of the H1 and uh, 21 centimeter is. And then we um, stack our simulations on the mock catalogs to construct a stack and compare that to our measurements rather than trying to reconstruct the cross power spectrum from the measurement directly. Yes. So hopefully. That. Yeah, I think that answered the question. Otherwise, uh, so I think keep writing. Um, maybe I can ask something just. Uh, what's the outlook with the chime data now so what's next for you guys great so i think our next goal is to attempt to measure the power spectrum in autocorrelation um i think that's definitely uh there's a straightforward path to that to measuring it at high delays um but that's going to suffer from the same issues with interpretation with modeling these nonlinear scales. Um, and eventually we would like to identify the BAO uh, signature in the power spectrum and use that to constrain cosmology. So in order to do that, we have to go to uh, smaller scales and that's going to, or, uh, larger scale, smaller K modes. Uh, that's going to require some combination of shorter baselines in the angular uh, direction, which I don't, I actually don't think will be an issue. Um, but what's going to be challenging is moving to smaller delays. Um, and that's going to require some combination of improvements in the primary beam model and alternative foreground removal techniques. And just to highlight what I mean. Um, so this is the delay power spectrum. Um, and, you know, we need to be getting measuring this regime uh, where we're currently dominated by foregrounds uh, due to uh, our, our, our dominant um, systematic is foreground leakage due to our primary beam pattern. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the nice talk. And thanks. Thank you, all the speakers. So I think that uh, there is a, the session is not over because we have an extra talk. Um, am I correct? Uh, yep, that's right. Uh, in an earlier session, there was an issue of an internet connection. Uh, so we're going to play a recorded version of Ellen Boto. Johanna's talk right now. Uh, and he's also here with us to answer any questions. So if you have any, put them on Slack and he can respond to them after the recording. Great. Okay. Thank you. My name is Elimboto Johanna from Dar es Salaam University College of Education, which is a consultant college of the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. I'd like to thank all the organizers for giving me an opportunity to present to this conference. And my talk is about recovering 21 centimeter signal from simulated fast intensity maps. FAST is a short end for 500 meter aperture spherical radio telescope, which is the largest single dish radio telescope in the world, and possibly the most sensitive single dish within its frequency band. In our study with FAST, we have prioritized the use of H1 intense mapping for a number of reasons, as you can see on this slide. But most importantly, H1 intense mapping sacrifices on resolution. 
and the inserted focuses on aggregating or collecting neutral hydrogen signal distribution information over large patches of universe volume. The underlying neutral hydrogen signal distribution will enable us to constrain cosmological parameters such as dark energy question of state at low rate shift through matter power spectrum. In our study with first, we have used a number of parameters, as you can see on this slide, and they will make reference of some of these parameters as we move on. Neutral hydrogen signal power spectra is particularly very important and of our interest. And as this is the average neutral hydrogen signal power spectrum computed at the mid frequency of the frequency band of our interest, which is 1,200. And the 55 megahertz. As a number of colleagues have already pointed out, the biggest challenge of using intense mapping technique is the foreground contaminants from our Milky Way galaxy and the extra galactic point sources. Known contaminants include galactic synchrotron emission, which is the most bright foreground caused by emitted electrons spiraling in galactic magnetic field. We also have emission from the background of electric point sources, thermal noise, free free radio emission, RF way, one of life noise, time variable noise, and atmospheric effects. This is a simulation of various sky components in terms of power spectra just to show their magnitude. Most importantly, one of earth noise is of particular interest and is a power spectra dense OPSD for thermal and one of earth noise contaminated receiver is given by this question here. And the limit for which the spectral index of the frequency correlation is defined, that's the value of beta, has the following interpretation. When the beta equals to one, this means noise is uncorrelated in frequency. And for beta equals to zero, means noise is correlated in frequency. This is a simulation of one over F noise, uh, a projection um, in equatorial plane as, as a more wide view. One over F noise uh, has features that look or more or less the same as a neutral range signal of our interest. Our interest is to apply PCA, which is a simple and parametric method for extracting useful information from a high dimensional data set. This is a blind approach. So PCA reduces a high dimensional data set, in our case, N mu by NP, where and mu is the number of frequency channels and NP is the number of pixels of temperature fluctuation map by projecting it into a smaller dimensional subspace. Compress that set usual captures the essence of the original data. We have an advantage that uh, as many colleagues have already pointed out that the foreground is expected to be smooth and a correlated in frequency. This property enables the PCA to cluster the contaminants of foreground information and a strip it of the sky. This is a simulation of the frequency spectrum for galactic synchrotron, the galactic point sources, and the free free emission. Actually, is a temperature flux at a given pixel and a higher temperature at low frequencies expected due to the galactic foreground signal domination. Applying PCA to clean the maps and ultimately end up with the power spectra is equivalent to remove the first few principal components, uh, equivalent to the principal axes one, two, and three, and uh, this the features that correspond to this principal components or the sky information is almost 99% of 
the whole sky. So PCA result, as we apply one mode, remove, you can see that uh, contaminants are suppressed, but we then attain almost perfect remove of contaminant after uh, applying four modes, after removing four modes by using PCA. We also check the how the input and output uh, neutral agent signal maps compare to each other and find that the standard dispersion between input and output signal uh, give us a value equals to 0 0.034 millikelvin indicating that PCA is robust and they can systematically construct the neutral hydrogen signal. We also represent our result in terms of power spectra and from the upper left panel this is a power spectra simulations without semi noise after removing one two three and four modes and also on the right panel that's top right panel the simulation includes semi noise and uh, for the lower panel uh, we include semi noise but because the PCA is hampered by systematics and noises that make it difficult to completely cover the noise. And these systematics and noises uh, add some bias to PCA. And we try to de bias uh, the recovery of nitrogen signal by taking the foreground map plus noise plus nitrogen signal apply PCA and then subtract the foreground map and the noise map after applying PCA as well. So after doing that, we almost recover the neutral energy power spectra perfectly. We also perform the Fourier transform on the data cubes uh, uh, with the given information, the data cubes were of 10 degree by 10 degree and with a range of right ascension from minus 5 degree to 5 degree, the de declination of 150 degree to 160 degree for frequency range from 1050 megahertz to 1250 megahertz. So they computed two dimensional power spectra uh, look of the recovered and the simulated signal are very close to each other, indicating that PCA can do well in recovering the signal, but with some small mismatches. We assumed the special flat lambda CDM model. So this is the result of the t of transforming the data cubes and then computing the power spectra two-dimensional power spectra. So as you can see here, there is uh, the simulated neutral energy signal and the recovered signal are uh, close to each other with some small mismatches. And the difference or the level at which PCA is able to recover the signal can be seen by comparing the recovered signal and signal that's contaminated with the foreground. We also check the how the precision of PCA, that's the neutral energy signal recovery, varies with observational time. And I find that if we increase the observ observational time, PCA recovery precision is likely to increase. Similarly, if we decrease the survey area. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you, Alimboto. There are questions. I can always write also at later times questions on the Slack. Maybe I have a little one. Um, I didn't quite understand uh, how you recover like the 
um, the, the bias that you have with the PCA. Uh, it was a really small plot. I don't know if, if you can oh. comment on that. Oh, yeah, we tried to address the bias by taking the foreground map, a noise map, and H1 signal map, and then apply PCA. And then apply PCA on foreground and a noise map and they take a difference. Because the assumption is the, st the kind of systematics that are caused by the noise, if we, we apply the PCA on the two maps that contain the noise, so the result can have the same effect, which can be cancelled by mix subtraction. So that's how we try to address it. Great, thanks, clearer. So, mm -hmm. yep, if there are other questions, please write them down in Slack. We can keep discussing there. And um, unless the organizers has had something else to, to tell us, I think we can close the session here. I think that's it. Just thanks again to all of the participants for some really interesting talks and thanks to you, Isabella, for chairing the session. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. See you later. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Hello. Hello. Quick debrief. Oh. Yeah, that, that, that's what. Sure.